Squidward is the caretaker for SpongeBob. He's like a little bit special needs. Man, Mr. Krabs really taking advantage of SpongeBob. The Wentworth Bros. We're back again this week. I feel like we have a lot more in store this week than we usually do. Yeah, what do we got? We got SpongeBob. We'll do SpongeBob later in the episode. We're going to touch on some Jimmy Neutron too. I want to get into that. Jimmy Neutron and we got some new Nintendo rumors. That's right. Let's start off with those. So Illumination just pitched to Nintendo a Nintendo Cinematic Universe. As excited as I want to be about that, I just don't see it happening. I don't think we're going to get that Smash Bros. movie. Well, the rumor is the pitch is in. So if Nintendo accepts, we could get Star Fox... We could get Metroid. But Legend of Zelda is already working with another studio. So that's going to throw everything for a loop. Yeah, but they could do some Spider-Verse thing where characters just become animations. Like a Jimmy Timmy Power Hour where <laughs> they yeah. change animation styles. Yeah, they can easily do that. Then Kirby. Kirby's going to be interesting because how's he going to talk? I think Kirby would be a cool story. I think Kirby out of all of the Nintendo franchises fits that Illumination style the best yeah if they can figure out a good voice for him like imagine all the waddle d's being like minions <laughs> Jeez, yeah. but the end goal has to be a smash bros movie if we don't get that there's no point in the cinematic universe in the pitch that's at the end they say they want to end it with a they want to do a bunch of spin-offs and then end it with the smash bros movie That'd be pretty crazy. I feel like that's what everyone's clamoring for after the Mario movie. Smash Bros. is supposed to have a huge year in 2024, too. 2024 is the 25th anniversary of Smash Bros. And Nintendo already announced that they're having these celebrations, these big events, that they're making a big deal out of the 25th anniversary. But I don't know what the big news is going to be. They're not going to announce a new game. They're not going to announce new DLC because they're waiting for that new system. It's too early for the movie. Yeah, I doubt they'd bring new characters in at this point. I think we could see Smash Bros. All-Stars. 25th anniversary edition of Smash Bros. All-Stars. Get us the N64 version, Melee and Brawl. Yeah, that makes all sense. in one game. That kind of makes sense. That would explain why they never put the OG Smash Bros. in the N64 expansion pack thing. Yeah, that's true. And they've been doing all these remasters with Paper Mario, Luigi's Mansion, Mario RPG. Why not remaster another one until we get to that new system? Yeah, they'll probably remaster Melee. The crown jewel of the Smash Bros. universe. Yeah, if they really want to give back to the fans for this anniversary, that's the way to do it. Oh, before we forget, we got a pack opening today. Some new packs. and uh, These are pretty expensive. Inside these packs is a $1,000 Elephant Mario card. <laughs> it's like... Only a thousand made. I'm excited. I've never opened or even seen a Mario trading card before. Yeah, these apparently came with the Walmart pre-order. Huh. There's only about 30,000 packs and a thousand Elephant Marios. Ooh. So, maybe we can get lucky today and make a thousand bucks. You want to rip into them now? Let's do a one now, one later like last week. Alright, I think I'll go first this time since you went All first right. last time. All right, I don't know. Oh, I don't know where, where the card's <laughs> going to be. Which way to go with this? Right, I'll call it out. We got Luigi to start. Oh, yeah, I see how it goes. So they give a little bit of a description on the back. So Peach. Peach, okay. I'll call it, I'll call it. Elephant thing. Bull Rush. Yoshi's. Ooh, I like that card. Hippo, Hoppo. Okay, okay. Nabbit. Ooh, a little Nabbit. Bowser. We're getting there. I think this is supposed to be the one. The, Ooh, no. the Trotten Piranha Plants. And then we got the Prince Caterpillar. And then a Poplin. So no Ooh, Elephant Mario. And he didn't hit. No Elephant Mario in my pack. We'll have to wait until later to see if Drew can hit. Okay, now let's get into a new segment. I feel like this one's going to trip you up a little bit. Which character came first? Mario or Pac-Man? Uh, Pac-Man. Pretty sure it was Pac-Man. Yup, Pac-Man debuted in 1980, while Mario debuted in 1981. Jeez. Donkey Kong or Mr. Game & Watch? I gotta go Mr. Game & Watch. He's like the OG character. Correct, just barely. Again, Donkey Kong, 1981, Mr. Game & Watch, 1980. Alright, give me a tough one. Mega Man or Samus? Ooh, Mega Man. 
Samus actually came oh, first. Oh, what? 1986, while Mega Man debuted in 1987. Wow, that's close. Sonic or Yoshi? Sonic. Positive on this. Oof, that's a tough look. Yoshi, really? Yoshi debuted in Super Mario World 1990, while Sonic debuted in 1991. Wow, I knew Sonic was 91, but I thought Mario World was 93 for some nope. reason. Bowser or Link? Bowser. Because he was in the first Super Mario Bros. And I don't think Link was before that. Correct, but it's closer than you think. Bowser, 1985. Link, 1986. And lastly, Pikachu or Kirby? I'm pretty sure it's Kirby. Because Kirby was early Game Boy. Pokemon was late Game Boy. Yeah, we got a bit of a difference there. Kirby, 1992. Pikachu, 1996. Not bad. It's time for some SpongeBob theories. Let's rock. So I came across this one theory. I don't know, this one's just funny to me. It goes like Squidward SpongeBob's caretaker. What? <laughs> Squidward is the caretaker for SpongeBob. Why would SpongeBob need a caretaker? Because he's special. <laughs> he's like a little bit special needs. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. He keeps an eye on SpongeBob. That's why they're neighbors. That's how they can even afford houses with the pay of a cashier and a fry cook. That's true, yeah. With the cheapest boss in the game. Man, Mr. Krabs really taking advantage of SpongeBob then, if that's the case. Yeah. Who knows if he's even working there? Because maybe Sp Squidward's just got to watch him. Well, SpongeBob's putting in the work flipping those patties. If we can't see how how they taste or how they turn out, for real. I guess it would make sense. Because in... I'm pretty sure SpongeBob's parents are rich. So they're just probably paying Squidward to watch over SpongeBob. That's why he lives right next door, too, and doesn't move away, even though he hates SpongeBob. <laughs> yeah, he's, he gets annoyed at everything, but when SpongeBob is actually in peril, Squidward's there for him. So he is keeping an eye on him. Yeah, that's a funny theory, but I want to go into like a darker theory. For Spongebob? For Spongebob. There's a theory that Patchy the Pirate is the Flying Dutchman. The Patchy the Pirate, that's the leader of the fan club for Spongebob? Yes, that guy. <laughs> and there's a lot of evidence for this. Remember when they have the board game? One of the early episodes, they bring out the Flying Dutchman map? Yeah. Patchy has a map just like that. Before that episode airs. Huh. That looks almost identical. I mean, they kind of look the same. They both have that beard, the pirate hat. Yeah, both pirates. And that same voice, similar voice, that piratey voice with that high pitch. And Patchy's favorite episode is Shanghai. Which one is that? The one where they board the ship of the Flying Dutchman. Oh, yeah, and they become part of the crew. Yeah, it's like Patchy's first real interaction with SpongeBob as a crewmate. That's where he starts to first form a bond with SpongeBob. And that obsession starts for Patchy. And we know that Patchy's been to Bikini Bottom, because on the dumpster in the back, he has his name scratched into the dumpster. Patchy was here. So he's like a time-traveling ghost. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The timelines are a bit confusing there. There's no other way for him to get down to Bikini Bottom like that and talk about the episode at the same time if he's not a time traveler. Right. And at the end, we even see in one episode, one of the newer ones, that the Flying Dutchman was roasting the same exact bird that Patchy has. No! Yes! I don't think that there's any denying that they're the same person. It's gotta be some alternate timeline interdimensional travel going on here. Yeah, the Flying Dutchman is like way meaner though than Patchy. Yeah, there's, Patchy's just like a goofball. There's something weird going on there. I always like the dynamic of the Flying Dutchman and Mr. Krabs the best. I mean, there are two sides of the same coin, it feels like. <laughs> Mr. Krabs even sold his soul to the Flying Dutchman one time. <laughs> I do remember that, yeah. In the episode Money Talks, Mr. Krabs sells his soul in order to talk to money. <laughs> that was his wish. But we find out he sold his soul eight other times. He even sold SpongeBob to the Flying Dutchman once for, I think, <laughs> 62 cents. Yeah. And he sold his soul to Spongebob as well. <laughs> so what were these other things he sold his soul for? How was he getting all these souls? <laughs> yeah, maybe on the black market or something. It was a soul black market. I wouldn't put that past Krabs. But that means Krabs must have eight other, like, superpowers. He's yeah. Su he's super strong. He's got a formula for the most popular food in Bikini Bottom. That was probably the first thing he asked for was a formula. 
that everybody would like right jealous of and only he knows about it honestly at this point i'm surprised mr krabs isn't locked up with the amount of stuff that he's done <laughs> Hey, that's probably one of the things he sold his soul for. Get out of prison. <laughs> yeah, a get out of jail free card. You know, there is one character that actually is in jail. From SpongeBob? No, no, I want to go into my, uh, go into my Jimmy Neutron theories. It's not even a theory. This is confirmed. Oh, really? Yeah. Sheen from Jimmy Neutron is a criminal. Confirmed? Yeah. So Rob Paulson, the voice of Carl Weezer, he has a podcast. And on that podcast, he was talking in character giving an update on the Jimmy Neutron universe. He's saying this as Carl. Yes, this is in character as Carl, all canon. Okay. He had a crush on Cindy. That Doppy was really him dressed up in a costume. And most importantly, he said that Sheen is back from planet Xenu and he's locked up in juvie. In jail? <laughs> yeah. So Sheen is some kind of intergalactic criminal in the Jimmy Neutron world now. Wow. wonder what he did. We don't know what happened, what he did. All we know is that he's serving time. So if they bring back Jimmy Neutron, no Sheen. Or it could be his prison break episode. Oh, yeah. If there is no Sheen and a Jimmy Neutron return, I don't know if I'm watching. He was like my favorite character. Yeah, Sheen. Jimmy, Jimmy was pretty cool, too, though. And Jimmy's dad. <laughs> Jimmy's dad had the best one-liner. You gotta keep the glove up, Jimmy. Now, this one's a split seam fastball. <laughs> Oh, rub some dirt in that, son. He did have one episode, though, where he really shined. And it proved that Jimmy Neutron's dad is the best role model as a family man. What? Yeah, believe it or not, Hugh Neutron is the best dad. He doesn't even have the IQ for that. <laughs> well, in one episode, he reveals that he was able to invest in McSpanky's, their version of McDonald's, when it first opened up. But he decided not to. But if he did... Oof. But if he did, he would have been a millionaire. And Jimmy heard that, and he was like, I gotta go back in time, convince my dad to invest. And so he did just that. And when he came back to present time, they were rich. They had everything. But Hugh, he treated everyone like garbage. Didn't pay attention to Jimmy and his friends. Was a cheapskate. He wouldn't pay for his dad's surgery. Treated his mom like garbage. All he cared about was money. And Jimmy missed his loving, caring dad. So he went back in time, reversed his actions. And when he came back, he asked his dad why he didn't invest in McSpanky's. And his dad told him he used that money to buy Judy a wedding ring instead. Oh, wow. So did Jimmy even exist? Yes, he just didn't care for him at all. Oh. <laughs> but it's revealed it was more important to Hugh to get a ring for his girl than it was to invest in some business. Because he cares about his wife, he cares about his kid, and he cares about the people he loves more than just money. Jeez, it makes me think of this other dad who's like pretty misunderstood. But I mean, he's really evil, but it's because of his backstory. It's not because he's evil. Who? Dr. Doofenshmirtz. <laughs> Dr. Doofenshmirtz? I, yeah, I forgot he is a dad. Yeah, Doofenshmirtz has the saddest backstory of any character there is. Did they ever explain his backstory? Yeah, yeah, in some episodes there was clips that would show. Dr. Doofenshmirtz was abandoned by his parents. Jeez. Rejected. They rejected him completely. And they only brought him back when they lost a bunch of money and they needed him to make them some money. So they dressed him up as a gnome. What? And he sat outside their house, dressed up as a gnome, for years. Oh my gosh. And his only friend was a balloon with a face drawn on it. And one day it flew away, so then he was left with no friends. He was just a, a gnome. And they had a dog that got him rich at one point. So they could have had little Dr. Doofenshmirtz stop being a gnome. Yeah, that would make sense. But they just kept making him a gnome. <laughs> Sitting out on the front porch as a gnome. Oh my gosh. And it gets worse. Doofenshmirtz eventually has a little brother. His parents give birth to a new kid. But they expected the kid to be a girl. So the mom had sewed a bunch of dresses that were no longer in use. So, <laughs> to, in order 
to put the dresses to use. <laughs> Doofenshmirtz had to wear the dresses to school. Oh my gosh, this poor guy. Had to wear the dresses to school, was bullied relentlessly, and his only friend ended up being a cockroach throughout his school days. Better than a balloon, at least. Yeah. He was a genius, but his parents didn't even respect that. They respected his brother, Roger, because he was good at sports. So, <laughs> so Doofenshmirtz got no love as a kid, but he made up for it, and he gives love to his one daughter. Wow. The one good thing Doofenshmirtz does is he makes sure his daughter gets everything she needs. Yeah, because he knows how to not treat a child now. Exactly. And shows Doofenshmirtz is a good guy. Yeah, that's a tough backstory to come back from. I can't blame him for being evil. Yeah. Oh, and there's this other theory I heard of. It's about Andy's mom and Toy Story. Because you know Andy's mom was the original owner of Jesse. Right, I think we figured that out in Toy Story 2. Yeah, she ended up having the same that red hat that Andy wears now. Right, right. Well, when you look at the Monsters, Inc. movie, the first one, we see on Boo's table a Jesse doll. And she ends up playing with it at some point. And we know the Jesse doll and Woody are very rare collector's item toys. Yeah, they're basically one of a kind. Close to it. So the chances of Boo having it and Andy's mom having it are pretty slim. I mean, it's possible, but there's also a good chance that Boo is Andy's mom. Whoa. Because <laughs> those timelines kind of collide when you add them up in the Disney universe. Right, and in, in Pixar, I think every movie is related to one another. So They're they, all in the same cinematic universe. Right. So Boo could grow up to be Andy's mom in Toy Story? It's definitely a possibility. I love how Pixar always has those little Easter eggs to try to connect everything. It makes me feel like gratification as a fan, that they're paying attention to connect the dots on all these different movies. Yeah, it's smart that even cartoons do it, you know, with Spongebob. Yeah, and then, like, the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour, they had a crossover yep, there. Yep, yep. But the most anticipated crossover of all time was That So Sweet Life of Hannah Montana. When they meshed That So Raven, Zack and Cody, and Hannah Montana all into a three-part special. Did that happen? Yeah, I remember the hype for that being so huge. Like, they had countdowns, they had so much marketing for it, and I watched it back recently. Total disappointment. Well, I mean, it's a kid's show. Well, it's not even that, it's that there's barely any crossover. In the That's So Raven part, it's just about Raven, and Zack and Cody make a quick appearance. And then in the Zack and Cody one, it's basically a Zack and Cody episode, but Raven makes a quick cameo. And then the Hannah Montana part is the worst. Hannah Montana is in the last scene of the Zack and Cody episode, and then Maddie from Zack and Cody is in the first scene of the Hannah Montana episode, and that's it! It's just, And then it's just a regular old Hannah Montana episode. No crossover whatsoever. No intertwining plots at all. No! No crossing universes, paths, characters. It was just like basically three separate episodes with little cameos. I guess that's why I don't even remember it. Yeah, major disappointment. Do you remember that little green fish that got brought to the support group for the sharks in Finding Nemo? <laughs> yeah. He wasn't, like, super nervous to be around sharks. He was actually, like, a stone-cold killer. What? Yeah, he would eat other fish. But fish are friends, not food. No, he was going through withdrawals. He was a fish eater. Oh, true. That's why they had the whole... It was basically an AA meeting for fish that eat fish. Yeah, that's what it was. A oh my group. gosh, I never put that together. So, that was pretty obvious. <laughs> but yeah, we see the credits roll, and that little fish shows up, and he looks all nervous and scared, and then a fish swims by, and he eats the whole fish. He, he grows and eats the fish. Oh my gosh, I thought he was there as a victim, <laughs> not as part of the support group. No, he's one of the addicts. That's crazy. Never judge a book by its cover. Yeah. That does remind me, though, of this one theory that I saw the other day about another scared animal. Courage the Cowardly Dog. Courage. <laughs> Courage the Cowardly Dog is a show from a dog's point of view. It shows a normal world from a dog's perspective. 
and that's the whole basis of the show. All these crazy monsters and aliens, those are just people walking by outside, strangers. But Courage sees them as enemies, monsters trying to attack his owners. Yeah, that's how my dog acts. <laughs> exactly. And it looks like this place is just abandoned except for home because that's how a dog feels. It's, o- it's only familiar with home and everything else feels like nothing is around. Yeah, and even like dogs will bark at nothing sometimes. So those are like ghost spirits that they can see, supposedly. Right. So in the show, it shows the dog seeing these things that aren't even there in real life. Yeah, and that's why the the owners are just like completely oblivious to everything that's going on because they don't actually see it. Right. They're not panicking or scared or know they're in trouble, but Courage thinks they're in trouble. Because there may be some stranger at the door that he views as a monster or something. Yeah, I always wanted, like, a purple dog. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, Kurz doesn't even really look like a dog. He looks more like a pig with dog-like features. A pig? Yeah, the purplish pink. That's kind of pig colors. And I it's never, like, I never it's saw like that. purple skin. That's kind of like a pig. I don't know what you're seeing. Well, at least it's not like Goofy. <laughs> it's Goofy. Yeah. Or Pluto. Well, okay, let's let's try to settle this debate. What animal is Goofy? A hybrid? I actually never thought of that. He's a dog, I think. Yeah, Goofy is a dog. But why is Goofy able to talk and walk on two feet while Pluto, another dog, just acts like a normal dog? It's a higher life form. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's an alien? Well, some people think that Goofy's a cow. Because he has this kind of relationship with Clarabelle the cow, and he looks way more like her than he does Pluto, so he could be a cow. Maybe. I mean, his kids look more like dogs. Yeah, that was actually disproved by the voice of Goofy himself. He said that Goofy is in the canine family, and in his debut, he was originally called Dippy Dog. <laughs> so that's if that's not proof that Goofy's a dog, I don't know what is. Yeah, cow would be too weird for me. But I think it's even weirder that he's a dog that acts like a human. Yeah, you should have looked into that. <laughs> but I don't know. There's a lot of stuff in that Mickey Mouse family that doesn't make sense. Like Donald Duck. Have you ever wondered what's up with Donald Duck's voice? It's all high-pitched and squeaky, but it sounds like a duck. That's kind of what it's going for. Sure, that's why the voice was originally introduced like that, because he sounds like a duck, but none of the other ducks sound like that. Daisy Duck and the triplets all have normal voices. So why does Donald Duck sound like a duck while the others don't? He's more primitive. Kind of. It's actually because he fried his voice box. From what? Well, you know Donald. He rages and he gets so upset all the time. So his voice is in constant, like, stress. Right. Like he lost it. Exactly. So Daisy and the triplets once spoke like a duck like Donald. But once they got integrated with all the other people in the Mickey Mouse universe, they lost that accent and were able to talk like the others. But Donald Duck under so much stress all the time, ended up frying his voice box, and he talks like that all the time now. In an episode of DuckTales, they gave Donald Duck a fresh voice box, and he was able to talk entirely normal. Really? Yeah. He gave a whole monologue in a perfect voice. Hmm, that's interesting. So Donald Duck doesn't speak that way because he's a duck. He speaks that way because he rages so hard that he fried his voice box. Jeez. Well, I wonder what's wrong with Mickey's voice. Mickey's voice is funny, but if it just keeps going, it gets way too annoying. Probably got castrated. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our next segment. It's the same as the first one, but let's see if you can do better with these casted characters. Which character came first, Mickey Mouse or Winnie the Pooh? Uh, Mickey Mouse, pretty sure. Incorrect. Wow. Mickey's first appearance was in 1928, while Winnie the Pooh appeared in 1925. SpongeBob or Peter Griffin? It's a tough one. I'm gonna go SpongeBob. Incorrect, just Ugh. barely. It's a matter of months. Peter Griffin debut in January 1999, while SpongeBob was in May of that year. Damn. Ash Ketchum or Goku? Goku by years. Yeah, by decades even. Wow. Uh, Goku was in 1984, Ash 1997. Yeah, I knew that for sure. Bugs Bunny or Popeye? I want to say Bugs Bunny. 
Oof. Incorrect no. again. 1940 for Bugs. 1926 for Popeye. And lastly, Scooby-Doo or Garfield? Garfield. He's a newspaper thing. Had to be way earlier. Incorrect Ugh. again. Unbelievable. 1969 Scooby-Doo. 1978 Garfield. That was a tough break. <laughs> Surprised you didn't mention Tom and Jerry. Oh, that would have been a good one. There, that's an old cartoon. Yeah, I saw this thing on YouTube the other day. It was like, you know, there's like that episode with Tom and Jerry committing to <laughs> on the the train tracks. Yeah, they're sitting on the tracks at the end, and the train's coming. Right. Yeah. I actually watched like the full episode version. It's like so sad. Tom and Jerry were in hardcore simp mode for these two <laughs> girls. <laughs> They were buying them flowers, bringing them presents. Tom signed his life away. His leg. Oh my gosh. His house. Everything. Everything that Tom owned, he signed it away. Jerry too. Just for these girls to get the girl. But we see this other cat. A cool cat. (laughs) Comes in and swoops away the girl from Tom. And the same thing happens to Jerry. They both ended up losing their girls. Even though... They were the nice guys. Yeah, they gave away everything they had, but it still wasn't enough. Because someone always has more. It was just a a life lesson to not simp (laughs) over these girls. Otherwise, you're going to wind up on the train tracks. That was one of those rare episodes where they were actually friends at the end, sitting next to each other. Yeah, but there's been other moments where Tom saves Jerry a few times. Yeah, that's true. I guess I just haven't watched enough Tom and Jerry lately. I remember watching it on the boomerang version of cartoon network like after i'd watch the typical johnny bravo dexter's ed ed and eddie and then they would have the old classics like tom and jerry afterwards yeah and we all know ed and eddie's the best that's true yeah that's the only reason i watch cartoon network (laughs) oh my god i saw this a couple weeks ago i should have brought it up last podcast but uh plank you know plank of course Plank's an alien spy. (laughs) What? The last episode, the special with the crossovers with the aliens, right? On Cartoon Network. Well, at the very end, we see that one of the special agents for the aliens is Agent 314. And it shows plank (laughs) is an agent so after all this time johnny isn't crazy plank really is talking to him yeah all that debate is plank an inanimate object or is he real even in season two danny inatochi the creator for ed and eddie was saying that plank was an inanimate object but is he just part of the cover-up well i guess by the time season five rolled around the end they decided to make him real a living organism i always knew plank was real Agent 314. And Ed, off to the side, just getting his brain (laughs) sucked out by the aliens. Yeah, they sucked out the wrong people's brains in that episode. (laughs) Okay, guys. If you haven't realized, I've kind of lost my voice. (laughs) Um, But we're going to go into the last pack opening now. We got two theories left. Yeah, we'll hit the last theories after. We got to pray to God that the elephant Mario is in here. Here we go. Not looking at anything. Okay. Great. Let me let me get a good view here. First up, Mario. Regular Mario. Peach. Bull Rush. Yoshi's. You're getting the same cards as me. Hoppo. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Give me something. A Wubba Mario. Wubba Mario. Daisy. Uh, we're running low here. And then Toads. We got a couple more. Talking Flower. I think that's your special card there. And a Pop. Oh, damn. I really wanted to hit the Elephant <laughs> Mario. All right. No Elephant Mario. Damn. Okay, let's end this podcast with something that I've been grinding for a while. For some reason, I've gotten into a big retro game kick. And I've been playing a bunch of Dig Dug and a bunch of Frogger. What? <laughs> I've been obsessed with Dig Dug. 
Really? And as I was playing, I was trying to figure out the story, because it's just a regular arcade game. But, like, what's going on? Why is this guy digging? What are these alien-looking things? Is it a guy digging? Yeah. I didn't even know what Dig Dug was. Dig Dug, so Dig Dug is the name of the digger. <laughs> oh. But I figured out the lore. I put I put the pieces together and I got Dig Dug down. Dig Dug takes place on Mars in the future. Is he digging for like something, some gems or something? So let me explain. It's in the future where the Earth is rotting away and they're looking for a new planet to inhabit. That would be Mars. But there's not enough oxygen there for them to live because not enough flowers are growing. So they send these dig dugs over to rid the soil of pests. And those are where the aliens come in, the Phygar and the Puka. So the dig dug has to get rid of these so that the soil has enough nutrients to grow flowers. That's why at the end of each level, a little flower pops up because they're trying to get enough oxygen so that the people can transfer from Earth to Mars. And the only way to do that is through Dig Dug. It's all made up? Where'd you get this? That's the only explanation. Because why else would flowers be popping up? Why else is this guy wearing a spacesuit? <laughs> the, yeah. the guy's in a whole spacesuit just to dig into the ground. It's because he's in outer space. There's no oxygen there. Yet. That's true. That's at least one explanation. It's an arcade game, so you gotta kind of try to connect the dots here. Yeah, yeah. But there's one big plot hole in the other game I was playing, Frogger. That, I mean, you cannot miss. Why in Frogger does Frogger drown when he hits the water? He's a frog! <laughs> yeah, he should be able to swim. <laughs> Shouldn't he be able to swim? When I jump from a log into the water, I should be able to just swim across. But Frogger just drowns. Yeah, is he a frog? He is a frog! It's called Frogger! <laughs> that was a huge plot hole that they tried to cover up in later games. They put in his bio that some crazy accident happened when he was young involving water, so he never learned how to swim. But that also makes no sense, because when he was born, he was a tadpole in the water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he should have been born knowing how to swim. So there's something in Frogger that isn't adding up. Frogger lore goes pretty deep. Yeah, I just had to get that off my chest before I left, because I've been dying too many times in Frogger trying to get through the water. I've had enough of it.